Okay, so today and the next week, we're starting a series. It's called We Are the Church. And can I say this? I love our church. I love our church. I was uh, uh, in, the, in between two services that I was down in the children's ministry, and I love what they were doing and the songs and the games and everything. I love our church. I love young adults. I love the diversity of this room. I, this is like a picture of how heaven is going to be. People from every nation, from every language, worshiping one name. But I don't only love our church, I love the church, the capital C church, the global movement. And I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word church. Maybe you remember your mom slapping the back of your head to not fall asleep during Sunday, or you remember counting the tiles in the ceilings or trying to recognize every flag in the auditorium. I don't know what is it that comes to mind when you hear the word church, but chances are that it's far away from what the first disciples thought. There were no Bibles, no bands, no banners in the back, no bancomats. Anything that said it with the letter B was forbidden. That was a joke. But the church did not start it as an institution. It didn't start it with liturgy. It didn't start it with a service order. It didn't start it with tradition. It was simply a gathering of people united by one belief that Jesus was the risen Christ, the son of the living God. And that was all they had. And you know what? That was enough. The church actually was a movement that launched on an event around history. Unfortunately, we only talk about that event once a year, but the good news is that today is that day. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Amen? Yes. Pentecost Sunday happens 50 days after Easter, and we're celebrating the beginning of the church. Now, today and the next week, we're going to talk about how we are the church. But as we start the series, I want to give you some background about the whole idea of church. In the book of Matthew, actually, there's a moment where Jesus gathers his disciples and he asks them a question. A question that you might want to avoid because you may get information that you don't like. Uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And his disciple, his disciple responded with various answers. Some said, you're some kind of a reincarnated John the Baptist. Some say that you're like a prophet from the Old Testament. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I want to know, how about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter, we got to love Peter. He speaks up and he says, in Matthew chapter 16, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, whoa. Whoa, Simon, son of Jonah, blessed are you for this, this statement that you just made, that I am the Messiah, that I am the son of the living God, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, on this solid statement that I am the Messiah, that I am the son of the living God, I, Jesus, will build, and there's a word, my church. And the gates of Hades, in your translation may say hell, but a better idea is death. The, the gates of death will not overcome it. Meaning that no matter how many, how many people die or who dies, this church movement will continue forever and ever and ever. And even hell itself can stop it. Amen? So let me start by saying this. This whole idea of the church didn't come from one man. Church is God's idea. Actually, the first time we see the word church in the Bible is what we just read. And it's Jesus himself saying, I am going to build my church. And this word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And it's a compound of two words, ek, 
meaning out of, and kaleo, which means to call. And when you put that together, it means to call out. Or when you're referring to a people, it means the called out ones. So I love this word because Jesus is saying that together we are a gathering, an assembly of those believers who have been called out of the world into God's family. That's who we are. And the emphasis is not in a building. It's not in a place. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, not referring to a building, but to a gathering, to a congregation, to an assembly, to a movement. I love that. The church is a movement, a movement of people united by one simple message, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. It's about people like you and me that have put our hope and faith in Jesus. So the church is not about where, it's about a who. Because wherever two or three are gathered in his name, his presence is going to be there. And you and I are called to be the church. We are the church. Can you say that with me? We are the church. So shortly after this event where Jesus had this conversation with Peter and the disciples, Jesus was actually crucified, put into a tomb, but, you know, he rises from the dead, and he spends 40 days with his disciples. And during this time, he's kind of giving them the final instructions. Um, you know, Matthew says, or, or calls it the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. But in the book of Acts, there's an account of this, and right before his ascension to heaven, Jesus is gathered with the remaining 11 disciples, and there's about 100 other followers on a hillside, and Jesus tells them this. You know, remember that I said that you are going to go into the whole world to make disciples? But first, do not leave Jerusalem. Wait, because my father is going to give you a gift that he has promised. And then he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I can imagine the disciples saying, power, power is a good thing. We are going to take down over the Roman Empire. Yeah, freedom, I don't know. And the disciples, they're still thinking in terms of an early, earthly kingdom. Because remember, they're saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah. This Messiah was someone who was prophesied for thousands and thousands of years. The, the people of Israel were expecting a new king, a king just like King David that will restore the kingdom of Israel. And from that kingdom, there will be a king that is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so they're thinking now is the time. If he is the Messiah, well, the kingdom is going to be restored. Actually, if you read Acts chapter 1, the disciples ask Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he responds, yes, but it is not for you to know the date or the time. That's my father's authority. So I imagine the disciples thinking, so what are we supposed to do with this superpower that you're going to give us, right? And I think that just as the disciples sometimes misunderstood the power of the Holy Spirit, we can also miss, if we're not careful, its true purpose. So what's the purpose? What is the Pentecost does for us? What is it that the Holy Spirit will do for us? First of all, the Holy Spirit says that we are empowered to witness. We are empowered to witness. And in the Bible, this word witness describes someone who sees something and then talks about what they've seen. It's both a person and also an action. And it means basically the same thing that you're thinking when you think of a witness in the courtroom. It's someone who testifies to something that they have seen or heard. 
someone who will tell accurately what happened, an event, what a person did or said. And so in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, uh, verse 8, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus himself clarifies that their mission, and actually our mission, is to spread his message. The Holy Spirit, that's the true purpose of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit will empower us to be witnesses because Jesus knew that the disciples and us, we cannot do anything effective for the kingdom of God until we have his Holy Spirit. Remember the disciples, when Jesus was crucified, they were um, disappointed. They were disheartened. They were thinking, going back to their, to their old jobs and doing what they're used to do. But now... They were happy because Jesus was um, raised from the dead. He's resurrected, and they're like, yes, this is going to be super good. But now Jesus says, no, but I'm leaving. <laughs> but Jesus assured them that the Holy Spirit will empower them to be his witnesses throughout the world. Now, imagine standing next to Jesus and Jesus, who was crucified by the Roman Empire and that was hated by every religious leader, looked at you and he says, you, 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 all of you, you are going to take my message, the fact that you are eyewitnesses to my resurrection, and you are going to take that message all over Jerusalem. I can't imagine the disciples thinking, Jerusalem? Jesus that is where you were executed. There's an angry mob shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want to go there. And Peter's like, don't worry. I know how to cut ears. I got it cover. So, okay, okay, we can handle Jerusalem. But then Jesus continues and says, and go to Judea. Judea rejected Jesus' ministry. And Samaria they didn't even like to go there because the Samaritans, they were like impure, half brief. brief. They're, they're not completely Jewish. And then he says this, and to the ends of the earth. And at this point, they have must looked to each other and said, to the ends of the what? Who is going to listen? How are we going to speak their language? How are we going to get there? Walking? Do you know how big the world is? But yet, God wanted witnesses sent to all of these places. You know why? Because church, there's a world full of people who need to hear and see the message and the hope of the gospel of Jesus. Some of those people are right next to us. Some others are far away and are hard to reach, but the Holy Spirit will empower us to do this work. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, we will effectively share the gospel through our words and our actions. So to be witnesses, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we often misunderstand the power of the Holy Spirit. We think that it's meant to fulfill our plans and our desires, but Jesus made it so clear that the Holy Spirit is not me-centered, is Jesus-centered, is God-centered, is gospel-centered, is meant to reach those who are hurting without Jesus. Because this message and this movement was meant to touch every person in every part of the world. And that is exactly what happened. Think about it. I think this is one of the most significant prophecies in the whole Bible because you and I are in some way a fulfillment of it. We are here in the ends of the earth listening about the good news of Jesus. Amen? And then Jesus ascended and this group of 120 people returned to Jerusalem. And they met together in an upper room and they waited and they prayed. And they waited and they prayed. 
And they waited and prayed a little more. And two weeks later, during the Jewish celebration of Pentecost, something amazing happened. Let's read it together. It says in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So, at first glance, or even if you're new to church, this story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 may seem strange. Fire, tongues of fire over people, winds blowing. And it might seem strange, but if you connect this event to recurrent patterns and themes in the Old Testament, what you're going to see is that we are God's temple. Because you know, this isn't the first time that wind and fire appears in the Bible. And when you make the connection, you're going to see that, that we are God's temple. In the Bible, windstorms and fire are always connected with two things, two things, God's presence and God's temple. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses, uh, God revealed himself to Moses. Where? in a burning bush. And Moses was, uh, he's seeing that though the bush is on fire, it's not burning up. And God tells Moses, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. Suggesting that this is a place holy. This is like a temple. And then what is that God does? He promises Moses, I will empower you to free up my people. And then Moses deliver his people from slavery, and they travel through the desert to a place called Mount Sinai. And if you read in Exodus chapter 19, and let me make a quick break here. If you read in your notes in the Version Bible app, there are other Bible verses that are not in the screen, but you can take it if you go in events and check for Vienna Christian Center. Back to the message. Exodus chapter 19, verse 18. It says this, that when they get to Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Again, this fire represents God's presence. This mountain will become God's dwelling place. It's a symbolic temple. And then there God gives the Ten Commandments to the people that are going to free up the people. And then when they build the tabernacle, the tabernacle fires up with a cloud by day, and the cloud was filled with fire by night. Again, the presence of God. And then they create, they build an actual temple. And when they finish building the temple, the same fire shows up and says, this is my presence, this is my temple, I am now living among my people. In all of these stories, Moses and the burning bush, Mount Sinai, the tabernacle, the temple, all of them had fire resting upon a place. But when we read chapter two of Acts, this fire, where is it resting? Let's read it together again. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. It was this fire, and the fire separated into small fires that seemed like tongues of fire. <laughs> we are the church. And it's a temple made out of each one of you. The new temple is made of people. People, it's going to meet with God, not in a geographic place, not in a building, but in connection. When we, the believers of Jesus, are together, when we trust and follow Jesus, God now dwells in the midst of his community. 
his ecclesia, the gathering of the people called out to live by God. We are a living temple made out of people from every nation who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that was Pentecost. It marks the beginning of a new temple. And Pentecost only means 50 in English, right? It's a Greek translation of a Jewish feast called Shavuot. And that feast celebrated the day that Moses met in Mount Sinai, 50 days after the first Passover. And so Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, this is how I like to call it. We celebrate the day that God changed his address. God changed his location. He no longer lives in the top of a mountain. He doesn't longer live in the Holy of Holies. He now lives inside of every one of his followers. He moved from a temple to living inside of us. I know that many people are asking, where is God? Well, when the Holy Spirit descended, God stopped dwelling in a temple and he started living inside of every one of us believers. I love how theologian N.T. Wright put it in his book, Simply Christian. He says this, those in whom the spirit comes to live are God's new temple. They are individually and corporately places where heaven and earth meet. Did you catch that? Did you see the beauty of it? You are the place where heaven and earth meet. You are now the place where God lives. And what does that mean, Carlos? That means that today and every day, everyone around you has this chance to experience God because you are the place where heavens and earth meet. People will know where God is by the words that you choose to use, by the actions that you take, by the hope that you choose to live by. The Apostle Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God live in you? all of you together. But that kind of gave us uh, a sense of us here and all of those outside, like we are the people. No, actually what Pentecost shows us is that everyone is invited. Number three, if you're taking notes, everyone is invited. Pentecost was a festival where Jews from all over the world they came and gathered in Jerusalem. So the city was filled with people from over a dozen regions, different regions, different languages. And while these 120 believers were in the upper room praying and waiting, praying for the promise, waiting for, to receive the gift, there was a party, there was a feast going on in the streets. And then the Holy Spirit showed up in a powerful way, and let's read what it says. Verse four of Acts chapter two. It says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And utterly amazed, they ask, I know these who are speaking Galileans. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Suddenly, the Holy Spirit came and all of them could speak the language of all the people. I love what Luke says. It says that Jews from every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven was gathered in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost feast. And the crowd, they were shocked, asking, aren't these people Galileans? Meaning, aren't these just fishermen, uneducated people from Venezuela maybe? How is 
it that they can speak my language. You're a Galilean. You're not supposed to. And think about it. Getting the good news of Jesus to the whole world with fishermen alone will be tricky and difficult. Unless, what if the whole world came to them and they could speak their languages? What if the whole world came to them and they could talk to people from all over the world in their own languages? You know what? That's the heart, the beauty, and the genius of this church. Que no importa si hablas español, or if you speak English, oh, the Sprache Deutsch. And that's all the Deutsch that I have. Mi carte bitte. We, we realize that people literally from all over the world are coming to Vienna. And we want to be able to tell them in their own language, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. It is messy. It is difficult. This church is not understood by everybody. But <laughs> is for everyone. And when we surrender our diversity, the supernatural happens. So what does this mean? It means that this message was not just for one group. It was multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational. The whole world had come to them. And in that moment, God's family was extended to everyone. Jewish, non-Jewish, all of them in Pentecost. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he preaches the first sermon of a church. He stood up, he tried to explain, hey, what you're seeing, it's actually a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament. The young and the youth, they will have visions and they will have dreams. And he's trying to explain all of this. And he's trying to explain this is God's plan. And then he says, people of Israel, verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of it. Remember. This happened a few weeks ago. They knew who he was talking about. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is the Lord and Messiah. And in that moment, that crowd wasn't clapping or saying amen. Actually, a hush fell over the crowd. Nobody was speaking because Peter said, you did this. You crucified him. It's your fault. And then finally, someone cried out, brother, what shall we do? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, I invite you next Sunday to church. No, church didn't exist. It, it wasn't even there. You know what Peter said? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all of who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Repent. Turn from your ways. Come back to the family. 
Do you know who the all who are far off is? It's you. It's me. It's our children. It's our grandchildren. It's our parents, our grandparents. This was Peter's way of saying, this isn't just a thing that happened in Jerusalem. This isn't just a movement for a generation. This isn't just for us. This movement that has begun here and today, this message, this momentum, this supernatural power that you can sense in the atmosphere. This whole thing is not only for us, it's for your children and the children of your children and for every generation and the gates of hell will not stop it. This is something that is going to reach beyond our lifetime. Because remember, Jesus predicted or prophesied. He said, this is his church. And no matter who stands here, nobody, not even the gates of hell will stop it. It will continue forever and ever and ever. This generation may die, but the church will continue. This is an event that's going to touch people who are far off, people who haven't even been born yet. In places that don't know anything about the story are going to be rich with the gospel of Jesus. And then, Amen. The book of Acts tells us that, that this early church turned the world upside down. And you're going to listen about it next week. But right now, I want to steal part of Peter's ser sermon. I want to invite the worship team to come back. And I want to invite you to stand up and pray with me. The Bible says that all of us are sinners. And it also says that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So I can almost hear Peter saying to me, Carlos, you did it. You crucified him. It was your sins. And what can I do? Peter will respond, repent. Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Because when you do, he will forgive your sins. And when you do, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And listen to this, this promise is not only for you, but it's for you and your children and all who are for, far off. And maybe that's you today. You recognize that you are far off. Repent. Come back. He will forgive you. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. He is the same yesterday and today. And the, the same that happened in Pentecost is true today. God's presence is going to come and live inside of you. His power will come alive and will move inside those who live in obedience to what His Word says. So right there where you are, I want you to close your eyes, bow your head, and the whole church, let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me and say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. I receive it. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Forgive my sins. Save me. Make me brand new. 
fill me with your spirit so that I could know your love and show your love. Thank you for your new life. I give you all mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you did this prayer for the first time, welcome to the family. Welcome to the movement. Welcome to the ecclesia. You are the church now. And Jesus has promised that he's going to live and dwell in your heart. And he's going to continually fill you with the Holy Spirit. 